This made Pope Pius VII really supportive at first, but then Napoleon came out with the Organic Articles of 1802, and this did the exact opposite, took away a lot of the Pope's power. Um, he didn't want to look like he was betraying the revolution, which is why he did that. Was Napoleon Catholic? Wow. Was he a devout Catholic? No. no. What about his family? Do you know? His mother was a devout Catholic. Yeah, mom, mom was a devout Catholic, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he doesn't really, he's not against the, the, the Catholic hierarchy, mm -hmm. but... Yeah. What is, for what reason? Well, there are two things. Like, economic reason. Give me an economic reason. Um, God's people pay taxes to the church. That's right. Okay. So he probably um, got rid of those or, de or made them smaller. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, you know, the revolution came with the civil constitution of the clergy where they impeded the government, the, the church, to uh, ask for more taxes. But mm -hmm. during the Thermidorian, uh, reaction, okay, after the terror, uh, churches are starting back to collect, you know, taxes for the, and they got back some of their land and some of their buildings. And Napoleon is like, come on, guys, you know, you don't need that. This is, this belongs to the state because why? Listen to this one. This is nationalism. Napoleon believes that people from France paid for those buildings. Therefore, they should not belong to the church. They should belong to the state of France because the state of France represents the people of France, the nation of France. Okay? Here we go. Um, so after the Organic Chronicles of 1802, the Pope Pius was, um, he was furious. And he was forced to sign a concordat with the Roman Catholic Church. And um, his act of, he, this, what he did was really similar to the act of supremacy of uh, Henry, King Henry. And whenever he yeah. put himself ahead of the church and made himself like the head controlling. Uh -huh. yeah. So this is Napoleon's coronation. This is also when he crowned his wife, Josephine. And something that's kind of cool about this. Oh, I think it's Mary Teresa, no? Yeah, yeah, he married Mary Teresa before be, before becoming. No, it's after. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Mary Louise. Yes, Marie Louise. Marie, not Mary Teresa. Oh my goodness! Because my neighbors, listen to that. My neighbors, when I was a kid, you know, their name was Napoleon and Marie Louise. Yes, yes. So I'm confused. Sorry, Mary Teresa was more the mother of Marie Antoinette. Okay. Wife of Francis, Francis the Second from the Holy Roman Empire, who will become Francis the First of the Austrian Empire. Yeah. Sorry, so, because I made a mistake, so I had to brag a little bit about. <laughs> so this is the coronation of Napoleon by Jean Jacques Derby, who's the painter of the Revolution, the neoclassicist guy, I believe. Yeah, yeah, so, that's what it is. Yeah. So any, something that's cool about this one in particular. There's, there were two versions of this painting that we made. One is in the Louvre and one is in the Palace of Versailles. You can, this is the one from the Palace of Versailles because on the left there, okay, well, you can't really see it, but um, there's a woman in, dressed in pink. And I don't really know why there were two versions of the painting made. I assume it's for propaganda reasons, but uh -huh. I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of pomp there too, eh? Yes. Look at that. This is. Uh... A lot of, uh, you know, the fur on the, uh, this, this fur is called Hermine, okay? What is it in English? Hermine. Hermine? Oh, that's it? Oh, you guys are such good word stealers. <laughs> Anyways, this, this, uh, this fur is the most expensive fur in the world because the little, the little beast is that big, you know, it's like a rat, you know? So to have that, you have, you need hundreds of little Hermine, right? And where were they finding Hermine? Well, Russia or Canada were the best places. Yeah, so it was very expensive. Yeah. So, enemy conflict. The Napoleonic Code, when established in 1804, incorporated some of the principles that were fought for in the revolution. Such as, so there were various freedoms, freedom of conscience, freedom of work, individual liberty, and equality before the law. However, the code protected the interest interests of the employer more than the, the employee, 
and women's rights were still legally limited. So it wasn't perfect equality, to say, but it was a step in the right direction. So the, un the universality of the Nicole Plano Code brought France to a more centralized state of being, because prior to the Plano Code, each of the provinces were subject to their own sort of set of rules or laws. So this kind of centralized everything. So in 1804, Napoleon was crowned Emperor of France, effectively ending the consulate. He invited Pope Pius VII, seven, seven, seven. Okay. to his coronation, but he places the crown on his own head to prove his independence from the church, and also strengthening the statement he made with the Organic Articles of 1802 that the state is above the church. And the empire is established on the advice of Napoleon's police chief, Joseph Fouch. After the assassination attempt on Napoleon's life in 1804, so he with the argument that a dynasty would protect Napoleon's regime and render any more assassination attempts on Napoleon's life insignificant. So then Napoleon's personal life. He was married to Josephine uh, Buchanay over here during his time as first consul of France. Um, she was not that honorable in marriage, having a lot of affairs where he was off defeating enemies. So in 1809, um, they were divorced also because she couldn't bear him a son. And he remarried all, like, way after his time as consular or consul. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. All right. That is it, I believe. Wow, thank you very much. I really like it. Will we have access to all this information somewhere? Uh, the, 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 the sheet, your sheet, your notes? Oh. That, would be, that would be very cool if you can send it to me by email so I will be able to post it somewhere so we have the information. This is great, I love it, I love it. Okay, yesterday I've asked you to go Google for a name. Sir. Anyone did? Mister, you did, you went to, to see what Surkuf did. Yeah, really so, did. So how many people went and, and Googled Surkuf? You want to learn a little bit about this? I like Surkuf really much. Did you go? Yes, so, who's Surkuf? Yes, please, please he is what? Is it an no, Surkuf. No, no, no. He was a privateer. A privateer. He was a corsair. He was a pirate hired by government. Right. Where was he? Where, where was he living? Well, he lived in a very our region of France called Brittany, okay? And there's a town, or it's a city, it's a walled city. If you want to visit that city one day, it's called Saint-Malo. Saint-Malo, at the, at the end over here, this part of the world here is called the Finistère. This is la fin de la terre, the end of the land, all right? And on the Finistère, this is where the Brit Britain, or the, this is called also Brittany, and this town called Saint-Malo is a town of corsairs, pirates. If you've ever watched, have you ever watched the movie, uh, uh, what's the movie? Uh, pirates, Bunch of Misfits or something like that. Do you watch it? Well, it's pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much the same style of city. So you will have, you know, totally legit people and a lot of pirates. France never really controlled Brittany. During the French Revolution, actually, the Britain, the Brit in Brittany, there has been a royalist uh, revolt against the revolution, and many, many people in Brittany, even though they didn't like the king of France, they're like, ah, yeah, we don't like the king of France, we, don't, we, we, we hate the revolutionaries even more. And Surkuf would be part of this uh, counter-revolutionary movement. Surkuf has is a private fleet. Have you been able to see how many, f how many boats he had? Uh, I don't remember the exact yeah. number. It was a lot. Was it's a lot. lot. At some point, you know, I've read it somewhere, but I haven't been able to see it at two different places. But at some point, it's believed that he, he, he personally owned 10% of the British fleet. So what he's doing, usually, he's going close to a boat wearing a, a British flag, you know, a British fleet flag. I know the British believe that's a, and then when he gets close to them, he just attacked them, you know, it transformed. He takes mer merchant ships and turns them into cannon ships and he hides it very well. And he has real fighting ships and everything. And he is going to be, uh, well, before the revolution, it will, he will be a Corsair in the Indian Ocean. Why the Indian Ocean? 
That's right. That's right. So he's he's stealing from the British. That's what that's who he's stealing from. He's one of the richest men on earth, Surkov. Okay, and he has his own castle, his own fortress. He has his own island where he hides with his with his sheep, the ships sometimes. And it will it will it will it will destroy. And then Napoleon at some point needs. He doesn't have enough ship, he believe, and doesn't have enough people with experience on the sea to stop the British from, you know, doing their thing outside uh, in the ocean. So he will go to see Surkov, and Napoleon, he didn't want that to be written anywhere, but Napoleon will put on it, will go on his knees, and will walk on his knees up to Surkov, that is sitting on some kind of throne, and he will ask him to join his army. Okay, and of course, Circle would will say, "Of course, but I keep all the spoils for my for my friends, for my family, for everything." And this is Circle. So Circle will probably be be doing. He, he's like a commando on the sea, right? And he will destroy so many ships because in real battle, naval battle at the time, the British will always have the upper hand. So you need to have some kind of guerrilla on the sea, and Circle will be the guy doing that for Napoleon. He doesn't really care about Napoleon. You know, he can't he can betray Napoleon. He will betray Napoleon many times during the continental. What is the continental system? The system that um, was his embargo on Britain. That's right. And, and Napoleon is doing a blockade of the whole European continent to impede the British from trading. He said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna choke the economy of Britain. You know, this way." And Surkov will be one of the most important uh, traders there because he will he will trade a lot with the British anyways and get a lot of uh, get a lot of produce you know inside inside uh, Europe and uh, take a quote uh, you know a cut every time. Uh, but you know the fun thing he is extremely violent too. Uh, he doesn't mind you know uh, instilling fear in the British fleet. And many a couple of things about about her. One thing that is very very cool. One of the best quotes. I've ever heard, and it's it's really him. He said that. So one day, he, there's the the most important ship of the British fleet. You know, it's a brand new ship with the most cannons in the world. And then Sir Kof is like, I want that ship. I want that ship. All right. So he decided to send a little fleet to a, to arrest the ship and try to stop stop the ship the ship. He will go close to the ship on a very small, you know, a very small, uh, they call it a sloop, I believe, I believe. So it's a smaller boat, sailboat. He'll get beside the large British ship. And when the British figure out that this is not at all a, a ship in distress, it's too late because all the Corsairs are climbing on the boat, you know, using knives like that and using, you know, the same thing as we see in movies, right? So they get on the ship, and the first thing he will do, he will arrest the captain, so everyone on the ship just give up. And then the captain will say, you French, you only fight for money. Us, British, we fight for honor. What will be sort of answer to that? It's the best. My dear captain, you are right. We only fight for things we don't have. Now, I got another one. If anyone ever said to you, it won't happen, but if anyone ever said to you, you stink, what is your answer? Of course, I am sitting just beside you. See? All right, so this is great. So that's Surkov, and Surkov, but that's not it. Because Surkov, not only because, did you go to the website that's got <clears throat> of the week? I, I did, but I couldn't find them on there. Ah, but you found, you need to go on that site though. Because, okay, this this site called the Badass of the Week. Man, this sounds stupid. This is this is a guy in the United States. He writes a little paper back about, about, you know, very cool people. And every week, you know, he adds a badass. And then you and you go on this website, and he. But the, what's really fun, funny is the way he writes the articles. It's loaded with curse and f words and all kind of stuff. But it's really, it's still very accurate, you know. And the guy, the guy references everything he takes. You know, he doesn't take, he doesn't say things that he, he only believes. It's legend. If it's 